Ron is Accomac Cherokee, descended from the Gingaskin Reservation on the Virginia Eastern Shore, as well as the neighboring Assateague people, Lenapes, and African American, and is related to Native families on Bermuda, whose ancestors were sent into slavery. Ron also works to coordinate Indigenous studies with jazz studies towards a new paradigm for American studies. He's reviewed jazz recordings for over 25 years, coordinated the Jazz Oral History Project at the National Endowment for the Arts and the Institute of Jazz Studies at Rutgers. He is writing has appeared in many books and um, he has published seven books of poetry and an award-winning essay collection. He grew up in Pennsylvania and he now joins us from Hadley. Finally, I promise, Ron is the project scholar for this whole series, for the Erasure and Restoration series and has been an invaluable member of the advisory committee that guides the scope of the series. So we're very grateful for his continued contribution and we're excited to hear from him today. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ron. And as I said, you will have, we will have time for question and answer at the end. Over to you, Ron. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Polly. Well done, and Wanishi. How are you, everyone? I'm very happy to be here, all of my relations, and they have all helped me to be at, prepare for this day and this moment. And I wanna thank each and every person. Uh, who have been here as well as those who may have crossed over. I would like to give a shout out about a couple of people who are very valuable in this central Massachusetts area in terms of what they had done and the things that they had tried to do. Uh, one is Roy Wright, who we lost a few years back. Roy was a linguist and a person of multinational native backgrounds as well as uh, European backgrounds. And he was an invaluable source uh, in terms of his linguistic knowledge. Another is George May, who was the leader of the Springfield Native Group uh, down in uh, Springfield. And uh, he was known as Greyhawk. And, you know, there's just, uh, uh, he, was a, he was a good friend. And, you know, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to, to know him even more. So what um, we're going to start doing and you'll have to bear with me as I toggle back and forth at times uh, with the, um, say, a PowerPoint presentation, which I prepared. And you know, we'll see how this thing goes. But uh, I greeted you in Wanishi, which is actually, it's a thank you, in the Lenape language. If you're going to say hello to someone in Lenape, uh, you say, hey. And I think it's probably where the word hey comes from. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know, uh, also there's the phrase uh, which means how are you doing or, and, and, and so forth, what's happening. The Cherokee language, you would say uh, CO if you know the person or OCO, as I'm speaking to just about everyone here, I don't know all of who you are. And um, <clears throat> which is equivalent to what's happening. So I feel it was necessary for me to uh, give that kind of uh, introduction where that's concerned. Um, I want to also mention that Christine was the one who got in touch with me about the fact that so many of the people who had been participating in these, uh, I guess we could call them seminars, uh, were concerned about the native people of today and uh, in this particular area, Marge Bruchak, Lisa Brooks, Cheryl Savago, Larry Mann, they have preceded me and giving a wonderful uh, backgrounds to in terms of the history. And I, I have to say it's more than just a background because it's kind of like, as we think of it as a living history. So um, I'm not by any means gonna to try to duplicate what they were doing. Uh, perhaps I can add a few uh, bits of information that people may be unaware of. I called the, the talk, I decided to give my talk the title of um, Living the Survivance in Algonquian Landscapes. The Algonquian landscapes in this part of the world would stretch from, let's say, the corner of, east of the coastal North Carolina, traditionally, up through uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, east of the Susquehanna River Valley, especially, all of um, lower New York State, uh, the lower Hudson Valley, 
and uh, out into this place that we call New Angleland, I mean, New England, <laughs> uh, and so forth, and up into the Maritimes and across the Great Lakes and so forth. And there, it goes beyond that, but I'm not gonna give you that geography so much. My, since I had grown up in the Delaware Valley, uh, which is Philadelphia, I'm a, I was born in Bryn Mawr College Hospital. Uh, Berwyn is my hometown uh, in Chester County. And I started school out there and I went out and grew up in Philadelphia. All around me, and if you, let's see. These were, you know, the Philadelphia area is Lenape country. And it's uh, traditionally, it had been known as the Wanakwe or a sassafras country. Sassafras uh, were very plentiful there in the olden days. And, uh, you know, this uh, person, Sandy H Hingston, I had sent to uh, Christina uh, a, uh, a page of resources. And what Hingston has done is she has compiled a lot of the names that I'd been familiar with in terms of even their meanings and so forth. But these are the names of places where I grew up in this, in this Philadelphia area. You, so you heard the sounds every day, just about. Wyalusing Avenue, for example, was in about four blocks away from me in West Philadelphia. And uh, it essentially means the place of the great warrior, the place of the great person. King Sessing is another. Passayunk, Maniunk, Wissahickon, Wissahickon Drive in Philadelphia, uh, Conshohocken. Any baseball fans out there who remember um, uh, Reggie Jackson would know that Conshohocken is his hometown. And it's sort of Northwest of uh, Philadelphia out near Norristown and King of Prussia and those places. Tioga is also in the city of Philadelphia. It's from part of the North, Northeast, lower Northeast. Perkyoman, uh, Tough Kenneman. These are names that that's out in Chester County where I have relatives. Uh, my stepdad was born in Avondale, which is a neighboring community. And Perky Omen is a township, not really a, a town itself. So I think, um, you know, when you look at the suffixes, Sing and Hawken and Yunk, uh, these uh, have some special meaning and they have always have some kind of special meaning for me. Uh, let's see here. Um, Right. <laughs> this I um, took from a page that was that I came and uh, encountered of, and it's actually from the uh, people of Nanatuck, which is this general area. Uh, it's from Lisa Brooks's book, uh, Our Beloved Kin, and uh, the students at Amherst College who are identified there. Uh, who were putting together a class project or part of a class project. Uh, they were the ones who quoted her. And I know that some of you may have uh, seen the term Norwatuck. And uh, you know, I've heard different uh, explanations for those distinctions in Norwatuck and Nanotuck. Uh, you have to keep in mind possibly that there was the N dialect and the R dialect of the sounds N, R, and L. Uh, those sounds have a tendency to be cloudy, shall we say. Um, so uh, I just wanted to let you know that some people may not know that uh, this is part of the Nanatuck community. These are the um, uh, people who were very likely, you see, uh, I, from what I understand, the Abenaki, I mean, pardon me, the Nipmuc people living out this far into and perhaps across into the Northampton area across the river. Okay, when you go further out into the west, you're getting into this area from what I understand of the Mohicans uh, who were living in this vast territory of the Berkshires and over to the eastern shore of the Hudson River, Hudson Valley, we cross over to the west, get into other territories. And of course into the north and it was this uh, with the uh, Mohawk and, and so forth. So I wanted you to know something about that and you can read that possibility here. Um, let's see. 
Oh, okay. I want to call your attention to some relevant information here. The book 1704, which is published by Historic Deerfield. This was came out in 2008 and Marge Bouchak contributed to this and there were a number of other people. And then the most recent one is the Pecumtuck issue that came out a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago. And it's, uh, there's a lot of good information in here that I think that you would find very useful. Um, that, uh, and you know, if you know anything about Historic Deerfield, I know that you could probably order them online, but you can also go up to Historic Deerfield. Historic Deerfield, I'm gonna point this out that in terms of the people today, uh, there has been, um, well, there are some lingering uh, efforts to keep the animosities at bay, shall we say. A number of the settler descendants uh, think about the terrible uh, events of uh, 1704, where people like Eunice Williams and, her, and, and others were taken up to Canada. And um, I would say that in a number of places, and I'll give, give you another site, out in the Cherry Valley area in uh, Eastern upstate New York, uh, west of Albany, and down actually not far from Cooperstown, is um, the people there still remember what they consider to be those terrible Indians who massacred their ancestors. So when you start to put a lot of this together in terms of how people are living and surviving, what, they, what kinds of strategies they take on and so forth, it's very important. I point this out, this book is, is good. Um, it's been around for a while, but I still think that its uh, information is relevant. And especially, uh, there's an essay in there by Thomas Doton called, uh, you know, having to do with the, the Nipmuc people and others who persisted in uh, Worcester. And uh, they were, well, they, they were protected as Tom Doton once said that it was the African-American community that kind of ensured they sort of protected the native people in that particular community. And, uh, down into the 20th century. Uh, and so, you know, I'll, I'm going to come back on to some of these other areas here in a moment. This, uh, as a matter of fact, I found this actually today. Uh, I believe that, um, not exactly sure whether this is debt mold or not, but uh, he has a, if you click on this Sokoki Journal, wordpress.com. Uh, uh, you'll find uh, this uh, sojourn, Sokoki sojourn, I'm sorry, uh, observations and experiences in Quinetiku Dawnland. Uh, this is a part of the Dawnland, uh, the Dawnland that moves out into the um, Atlantic Ocean. You know, when you, this is the area where people who would awaken in the mornings, along, especially along the coast, they knew that this was the Dawnland because there was no other land beyond that, you might say. Uh, but um, this, uh, this is a particular article that had to do with uh, community bills having to do with um, how legislatures behave and, and so forth in Vermont. And, and uh, it's very important, I think. I wanted to, you know, just to show you something about how contemporary people are doing some things. Okay, now. Here in this part of the country, everyone is still here. A lot of people may be hiding in plain sight, which is something that I'm going to be developing. Uh, reservations, as you see, are, uh, you know, they're sort of a, parcels, tiny parcels. In fact, the, the tiniest reservation in North America is that quarter acre of heartache down in uh, Trumbull, which is outside of, of uh, Bridgeport. It belongs to the uh, Pugusset tribe, and uh, they have more land out in you know central Connecticut, south central Connecticut, but it's actually one quarter. They've been squeezed down to that amount, and it's um, you know, uh, well, what, <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious about what the implications of that sort of thing had been, and especially even as the reservation itself had to be moved. Uh, you have a lot of off-reservation Indians, people who. Uh, may be a part of a reservation, but they don't live there. 
or perhaps they are not affiliated in some form, some form or fashion. Uh, you have um, tribal intermarriages, which continue these days. I mean, Nipmucks um, intermarrying with um, Wampanoags, uh, Wampanoags intermarrying with Montauki people across the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Sound, the, the Long Island Sound, and so forth. And then you have these refugee communities, essentially, which became reservations. For example, Scattercoke Reservation, uh, which is up in Kent, but it's part of the town of Kent, Connecticut, up in the northwest part of Connecticut. You'd be shocked, perhaps, if you would go up there and see what it looks like. It's an escarpment. And it's terrible the way that the colonizers put the people there. The only way to do any farming is to do it in terraces. Okay, now terrace farming is not something that's new, but when you start thinking about how uh, the colonizers decided to give the native people the worst possible lands for their survival, I think you can see something is starting to unfold here. Uh, the Ramapo Mountains, uh, the Ramapo uh, Lenapes, uh, there's, this is also a refugee community. It was a stronghold for Arapaho people, for the people of that territory. But the, um, uh, there are a number of people who have gone in there. There have been not only people from New England, but also from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, Southern New Jersey, even the Carolinas. Uh, you know, there are some Saponi and uh, Cherokee people who have uh, moved up into that area. Uh, the Ramapo area was in the news because of uh, not about five years ago, I guess. Uh, one of the, uh, I think it was the, one of the automobile companies was dumping waste and people were getting sick, coming down with various kinds of sores, dying with cancers and so forth. And get this, of course, you know, when they finally were able to, after num many years, get the string thing straightened out to try to get their money. Guess who took the money? The lawyers. So, you know, that's kind of one of the things that we have here uh, that, that goes on. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. I like this. <laughs> you know, these are, a lot of these folks are, are 20th century people, certainly. P published authors, you, you know, you know about Marge Bruchak and Cheryl Joseph Bruchak, who's the older, uh, the older brother of Marge. And there's uh, Larry Mann, of course. There's Melissa Fawcett Tantaquidgen, uh, Tantaquidgen Zobel now. She's down in Connecticut. She's published about two novels at least and a couple of other books. Rita Jo is, um, was a Mi'kmaq uh, poet who crossed over. Alice Azor moved out to Indiana and uh, that's where she still is. I was able to be with uh, Alice and a number of other people at returning the gift, uh, the 25th anniversary of that great festival. In uh, It occurred in uh, 2017. And then there's Paula Dove Jennings, who is, actually, I should correct this. She is Niantic, Narragansett. Because you see, after King Philip's, in the wake of King Philip's War, and in the wake of the Great Swamp Massacre, where so many Narragansetts were slaughtered, some of those who remained uh, were taken in by the, the Neantics. And that's why a number of these uh, folks um, uh, refer to themselves, even after all this time, as Neantic Narragansett. Then in music here, this is one of my favorite areas, uh, Ron Henry's Little Crow, uh, he sang with a doo-wop group, okay? A lot of people don't think of native people and singing in doo-wop groups and so forth. Uh, Rick Rossi and Lee Rossi, Mixa Sean is known as, um, is Lee Rossi is his name. They are um, Mohicanek and they play various forms of music. Uh, Rick Rossi, especially as a bass player, he's, he's had a lot of symphonic bass, uh, uh, contrabass experience. Uh, among the Wamps and, and, and so forth, you can see the names. Uh, uh, people who have gotten their degrees in anthropology from UMass include Carol Nepton and Marge, Trudy Lamb Richmond, who's Scattercoke, uh, was with the 
a Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Museum and a research center. And many years ago, she was with the, uh, what was called the Institute for American Indian Studies, which is a little outpost in uh, Washington, Connecticut. And, you know, you have the people who are a number of attorneys, Harry Wallace, uh, Kathleen Brown Perez, who's here in this area, Pam Ellis, who's NIPMUP. They're all attorneys along with uh, Roberta Hunter and, and, and um, Marguerite uh, Smith, an old buddy of mine. How am I doing? Can you, is this too much of a distraction? Are we, are we okay? Christina, I see a thumbs up, so okay. I think it's great. We're doing, yeah, it's great, yeah. Now, let me talk about some of these persistent anxieties since the Removal Act, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Actually, these anxieties about Indian identities were persisting certainly in this part, in the East Coast, well before that. There were a number of people who were attempting to assert themselves as native people and who would be threatened and pushed back. And this led to people deciding to um, live in, in, in kind of, well, in anxiety and, and even in fear. Um, and we all know something about, uh, there was a nice series, as a matter of fact, uh, on, uh, C, on uh, C-SPAN three last week, having to do with the Cherokee history and so forth and the Trail of Tears, or I should say the Trails of Tears, because there were other uh, Native groups, Native peoples who uh, were forced into that uh, circumstance. A number of people lost their lives along that. Um, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 has made all people of color vulnerable, okay? It wasn't just, uh, let's say, African-Americans who were slaves but also any native people who were slaves. Let's remember that particularly in the South in the 19th century, in the antebellum period, there were native people who were still in this kind of bondage, okay? So um, there were a number of people who started migrating up into New England, uh, the Saponis especially. Saponis are, along with the Tutelos, they are actually a Eastern Siouan group. They're related to the Dakota peoples, okay? Uh, they decided, see the this, um, histories uh, tell us that the Dakotas and that large family of people were living in the Ohio Valley about a thousand years ago, okay? Slowly they started moving out and uh, it took, you know, the migration period. You could say um, the Dakota peoples went out, uh, the Sioux peoples, that, I mean, yeah, the Dakota Sioux uh, went out around 1200, uh, the year 1200, um, the Assiniboine, uh, one of the names uh, uh, that they have is the, that they're the people who kept going. And so they ended up in mostly in like Manitoba and parts of Saskatchewan. But the Saponis and um, the Tutelos decided to move eastward into the Piedmont area of Virginia and the Carolinas. And so uh, these days, um, they, or I'm sorry, as, as a result of the Fugitive Slave Act, guess what a number of them decided to do? They moved back across the Ohio Valley into Ohio and even up into Michigan, even up into some of those counties in uh, Southern Michigan. So uh, the Saponi Nation of Ohio is one that um, uh, is kind of, uh, has pulled together with, um, uh, a number of it, it's, its folks. I should say, Rich Haythcock, who uh, passed uh, last year, uh, he was sort of the historian for them. And he pointed out a couple of people who were of that Saponi background. He said that, um, you know, because he was a historian and kind of a genealogist, uh, Carter G. Woodson, okay, you may not know, not, He's the man who started Negro History Week, okay? And um, he is supposedly one of theirs, as they say. Uh, the widespread fears of revealing Indian identity, uh, as you can see here. 
being called a free person of color or calling a colored person became a safety valve. You know, Native people became uh, rather pragmatic about using these kinds of designations or picking up on them even in spite of or the fact that they were um, designations given to them by, let's say, people who were taking the census. If you go back, you know, when you're doing some research and you want to look up uh, and find out, well, where are the Indians in certain areas? You're probably not going to find them unless they were on a reservation. And think about this. How many reservations are there in the eastern part of the country? There are some, yeah, but not that many. And especially in the southeast. In the southeast, you have not only is it European and Indian, but you have European, African, and Indian. So um, I re remember when I was growing up, my grandmother, uh, who was born in 1894, which was the uh, height of the boarding school era, uh, she would every once in a while, she'd go on a rampage through the house. I don't know what would set her off, but she would talk about people coming into homes and taking children away. And of course, I didn't ask her any what, what she meant. But when I got older, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't, you're, you're not supposed to, to question your, your elders. At least that's how I kind of grew up. But uh, when I would say, Nana, what is it that you mean? And she said, never mind. And just let it go with that. She would never explain these kinds of things. Um, the, uh, you know, the kinds of physical abuse there was a, when I was living in Brooklyn while I was studying for my PhD at NYU, over yeah. Manhattan, there was a man who uh, we lived out in uh, this. I was in my former marriage, and we were living out in an area called Prospect Park South. It was pretty nice out there, and um, there was a an apartment building, and there was this man who sat out in front of it during warm weather with his buddy who I think was a man of West Indian background. Anyway, one day I happened to be going, I think I was on my way home and uh, I saw him his, and I start, struck up a conversation with him. His name was Tommy. And what he told me was this, something, something similar. He said, and he was an elder. I mean, he was figured that if this was in the early eighties, he was probably about in his seventies or, or maybe eighties at that time. He said when he was a kid, his mother told him never tell anybody that he was an Indian because she didn't want him taken away from her. Now, isn't that awful? You know, that's, that's so can you imagine, think about if you've, so many of us have seen the photos of people like Geronimo and Sitting Bull. Think of them, uh, let's say living in uh, Virginia or uh, Pennsylvania and someone say, are you an Indian? And they would say, no, I'm part Indian, but I'm not an Indian. That makes a big difference in terms of that whole business of the identity issue. In other words, you're not a real Indian unless you're full blood. If you're a half breed or if you're mixed with something else, uh, you're not supposed to be a bona fide Indian in the eyes of the uh, colonizing uh, realm and, and so forth. And so, you know, a number of people kind of decided to hide out in that fashion, uh, hide in, in plain sight. When an Indian feels that Indians are people who existed long ago, you know, hasn't colonization done its work? The whole point regarding native people, especially in this westward push to, uh, realize manifest destiny was to get rid of Indians, okay? If the um, pathogens, warfare and so forth didn't finish the job, then you could just erase them. Um, uh, you know, my grandmother herself, you know, she, I remember one of the most painful, it, times when I was a kid, when I guess I was a teenager by that time, early, maybe 19 or even so, she said to me, we can't be Indians anymore, just forget about it. That's a terrible thing. Just think about that for a moment. Uh, all, all of this that I'm giving you, I'm sure has had replication in some form or fashion up in this area, okay? 
Um, I didn't put a title in here, but this is how, uh, you know, people have been used to get rid of, get rid of us in documents. You, in, in so many places, especially in some of these areas, when you see that a person is identified as a mulatto, we always think of a mulatto as a person who's mixed with black and white ancestry. It's not always the case. It could be a person who's mixed with a black and Indian ancestry, or it could be a person who's simply an Indian. But they're they are, uh, you know, the census uh, information will give you. It's very misleading. You really have to learn to deconstruct the census to get to some of the truths and find out who people are uh, that you're dealing with. Um, hiding in plain sight, okay? In other words, um, you know, some people talk about uh, Indian, uh, let's say African-Americans as wanting to pass as Indians. I think it's more the other way around for the sake of safety. Okay, simply for the sake of safety, protect their families and so forth. Um, let's see. Think about this here in Vermont. Now, this is a, as you can see, an Associated Press uh, uh, report. But even in Vermont, you know, there was Vermont and Indiana, especially, they had what would, uh, there was. Uh, Helen Hornbeck Tanner, years ago, she was a pretty uh, great scholar. Uh, she said that it was known as the Indiana program. And it was a eugenics program, okay, to sterilize people who they thought would be a burden on the state. This was the 20th century, we're not talking about 21st century, although it still goes on, all right? But, um, it was a plan to, st to sterilize uh, people. Uh, there's a book, oh, I can't remember the author's name, but it's called Breeding Better Re Vermonters. And uh, one of the things that I, I had some question about the book and about the author is that the author didn't put in very much about the native population that had been, uh, where the women had been sterilized. Sterilization is something that had been going on affecting Native women, African American women, and so forth, uh, particularly in places like Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, and so on. Um, so you know, there's a kind of uh, you talk about degeneracy. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it is it is degenerate to actually uh, force this sort of business on on folks. Uh, I'll come back to a few things here. Let's see. When I was doing my research on Ann Plato, and this was down in Hartford, Connecticut in the uh, 19th century, you know, if you look at some of the sites about Hartford, you'll say, well, it's all, the people of color were all black people. Well, they weren't. And I found I was able to get to some of these names, Rosella Apes, Louisa Apes, these are people who are related to, to William Apes, or, or, you know, AP spelled his name with uh, two S's. And then you have people of the Mason family, you have the Randalls, you have Cisco. Uh, I have here in Narragansett or Delaware, the, the Cisco family, I believe it is this person, according to uh, Ray Gould, who married into the Nipmuc community in the 19th century. But there's also, according to another friend who's a tribal historian for another Eastern tribe, she said, that uh, the name Cisco also occurs in uh, the uh, Delawares, among the Delawares, uh, or the Lenapes in that area. So, uh, you know, this is what uh, this is how we have to deal with some of these things. Here's another set of names: Babcock. So many of the Babcocks, even today, they're Narragansetts. Uh, there's Cisco, the Hazards. A lot of Hazard uh, are Narragansetts. Some of you may have gone to a powwow maybe even here at uh, UMass and seen the um, uh, uh, Hazard, who is a, uh, uh, he, he's, he works with wampum and, and so forth. And 
Oh, something else. What Reggie uh, told me, Reggie Hazard, who was um, Narragansett, and he's also been a part of the Nipmo community. He told me this. I said, well, I, I said, well, you know, when I was growing up, uh, there was uh, a basketball player named Walt Hazard. And he said, uh, he said, well, you know, let me tell you what happened. He said that Walt Hazard's ancestors were most likely the same people who were in the Civil War in this, um, let's say, a Black regiment. And when they were mustered out, they said they invited Walt Hazard's ancestors to come and live in Philadelphia. And that's where that Walt Hazard is. OK, that's where that comes from. Um, so, you know, uh, let's see, I may have to, <laughs> this, um, is Bermuda. I forget exactly what year this is, but Burn News is one of the major online sites, uh, for Bermuda News. You can see the woman, let me see if I can, in the, uh, lavender dress, that's my cousin Vinton. Okay, this is your boy here, <laughs> me. And these are some folks, uh, I think this is Judy. Let's see, this is Pat Whedon, uh, Anawan and, and David's wife, uh, uh, mother and Tall Oak, Tall Oak's wife. And I think Sherry may be in there somewhere, but I'm gonna be here right now. Let me say a few things about this before you know going on any further. In, after, in the wake of the Pequot Massacre, 1637, in the wake of the Great Swamp Massacre, uh, 16, at the end of 1675, and King Philip's War, 1676 was when it was supposedly over, uh, and also during G Governor Keefe's War in the Hudson Valley, 1643, 1644, many of the, some of the survivors of those conflicts were shipped out to Bermuda. Uh, you often hear people say that, well, they were sent to the West Indies. Maybe some were, but uh, the thing is that the West Indies does not include Bermuda. Bermuda is an Atlantic island along with the, the Bahamas. Don't make that mistake if you meet a West Indian person because they will set you straight. Uh, you know, they're very proud of, of things. But uh, there is an effort, there have been efforts by people uh, Patricia Hill, Patricia Penn Hilden is one of the scholars, native scholars, who's been trying to figure out what happened to the native people who were sent to Barbados. Uh, how it is that we have some of the records of, uh, so many of the records, as a matter of fact, of the Bermuda situation, but nothing pertaining to native people in uh, uh, going to being sent to uh, Barbados or any of the other islands. Uh, is not, I, I really can't explain that and neither can she. Um, oh, by the way, uh, there was a, I, think her, I can't remember her first name, but her name is Newell. She found out also that there were Apaches who were sent into the West Indies into slavery. Can you imagine that? Okay, think about that one. So now, along with This is my cousin, Ed Welch, found out that, um, you know, he knew that he, he was a, a, a Cherokee. He never, he had never met anybody with the name Wellburn before. And his great grandmother, who you see over his left shoulder, Perme, uh, Pernice Wellburn, uh, is, um, we don't know exactly how she's related to us, you know, in the Wellburns, it's possible that she was related to my uh, mother's mother as a West, because the West were living in that on that reservation, the Jingiskin reservation, uh, until it was, uh, well, until the people were forced to, to get out of there. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. But nevertheless, uh, Ed was a wonderful guy. I mean, he, he just opened his, his heart and his home uh, to Sherry and me, and and uh, I miss him still, missing uh, still missing him. Uh, he was the one who set up the reunion in 2010. 
it's possible that I may be related to what half of the St. David's Island people. I, you know, maybe have about a, a, another 400 relatives over there. St. David's Island is the, the name of the area of, of Bermuda where when slavery was abolished in the British Isles and in, in uh, Bermuda, that they congregated up into that area and so on. Um, I just would like to, before opening it up to some conversation and some questions and so forth and Q and A, uh, but point out that in this area, um, many of the native people who are here have been um, are newcomers like myself and my wife. You know, we came from out of the area. We have been um, uh, visible, I guess, because we haven't had that necessity, perhaps, uh, or we have been able to shed some aspects of that anxiety. But it's not always, you know, uh, that that may be the case. Um, I've met a number of people. Uh, Marge Bouchak has known a number of uh, folks uh, in this area. She's the one who, when they were putting together the 1704 um, program, and I was fortunate enough to be a part of that. Uh, let me see. She, you know, Marge, uh, some of you may have attended some of her performances of Molly uh, and uh, where she would dress in uh, the, uh, let's say the, the clothing of this woman who was uh, well known in, in the, you know, in this part of the, the, the territory. And one of the things that she would, would point out is that after the program, there would be people who would come up and whisper that they were Pocumtuck descendants. They were uh, descendants of uh, Abenaki. They were and so forth, or they may have been, um, you know, some other of the area tribes. And this is sort of this, again, as I would call this, this handed down anxiety of people wanting to stay uh, you know, under the radar because they didn't know, even if it was the 1990s and, 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 and so forth, or the year 2000, they just didn't know, they didn't feel that they could trust coming out and proclaiming themselves as being Indians. And uh, I mean, some did, but not very many seem to have done so. Uh, attending powwows, you know, powwow is not, uh, the powwow is the outer shell, you might say, of uh, Indian life, native life. It's a chance for people to come together, meet with their friends uh, and, and so forth and share talk and, and, and uh, just, you know, in, uh, hear the music, hear sings and, uh, and so forth. Um, some of the powwows in this area, I, I, okay, I mean, I think that our UMass powwow is pretty good, <laughs> uh, uh, but um, there are one or two powwows in the area that, uh, you know, have not been kind of, I've, I've seen the way that some of the people, we went up to one of them, Many years ago, we'd heard about it and it was as something to sort of avoid. We decided, well, look, we need to find out for ourselves. And, uh, you know, it, 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 didn't see, it didn't look right. It didn't seem right in terms of powwows. Uh, there have been people who, now I will say this, I'll give a, a memory shout out to a woman named Princess Winona, who was of the Androscoggin uh, people of southern uh, that area where Maine and New Hampshire uh, are uh, along the border. And the Androscoggin people, apparently they're, uh, from what I've understood, that they are Western Abenaki. But, you know, uh, one of the things that she used to do in putting on her powwow, which she called it more of an, an art festival, was that she fed her dancers, she fed her drum. You didn't have to, to have your food. I mean, you bring your food, but then you'd be surprised at well, she was feeding people. So she had a good heart. And I, and I want to remember her and her daughter, uh, who was, uh, we've often, uh, she's often been known as Little Winona. And uh, I don't know exactly what she's doing, but Princess Winona was resilient. Boy, she, 
even in her 90s, she'd fall, break her arm and the hip and stuff, and she'd still get out there. And uh, we used to see her a lot at the House of Message Powwow, her and Lynn. So I think, um, is there anything else that uh, I can, are there any questions? Um, I hope I've given you some kind of an indication of how things have been. It's uh, people uh, whispering, people who decided to live in refuge. And it can't be any fun to do that. It absolutely can't be any fun to not be who you are and uh, to be chided even for, for who you are, to be uh, the subject of uh, those ba 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 mouth and that sort of thing. And also with the mascot issue, uh, which uh, a number of people fortunately in this area and especially to the north of us up in the Turner's Falls area have been attempting to address. And, uh, you know, even with the Washington football team, I'm glad to see that Dan Snyder has come to some good sense while, you know, they try to figure out exactly what name to give that team. But um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, these things are going to start uh, falling away, these, these names and mascots. You can't honor a people if you try to wipe them out. And then you're going to, you know, you, uh, the Turner's Falls incident People were wiped out, okay, in that, in that refuge village. And then you're going to say you're going to honor them, you know, uh, by giving them a mascot and giving it a name of the R skins, you know. It, it doesn't make any sense, at least not to me. Now, some people may feel differently and, and so on. But uh, uh, this area is full of history. But it's not just the history that makes it, it's the people who are living here today, even if they are in spirit, uh, they may think of themselves as not here. Nevertheless, they are very much a part of the, the scene. And I would like to encourage them to, people to come out to uh, the UMass powwow, to come to, to be, you know, continue with uh, uh, programs like this. Uh, when the uh, Nipmuc powwow, pardon me, uh, gets started again next year, hopefully, uh, out in Grafton, that's the uh, House of the Message powwow. Go out there and, and be a part of things and talk to some of the, the people of the tribe and so forth. You know, it's a terrible thing to lose a sense of your culture. Um, no matter, you know, if you're mixed, it doesn't really make a difference. When up to, you know, I was working with the Native Authors Project from about 1980 and, and so forth. And people, you know, they see, well, if you're selling books, you must have all kinds of information. And I remember going to, you know, vending at powwows, whether it was Shinnecock or sometimes Mashby, Philadelphia. And people would come up and they say, how do I find out about my Indian heritage? And then they would start to, on the verge of tears, they would say, when I was growing up, and they would be younger than me, but uh, they, or maybe they would be closer to my age. My grandfather tried to tell me the stories, but I was too busy. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do that. Uh, I was attracted to African-American things. And then my gra I lost my grandfather. And now they're lost. And I, don't, I didn't know exactly how to respond to them except to try to, to encourage them to find other people in their uh, families and lineages and so forth. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Christina and to Polly, who I think have um, set up some of the questions for us, for me. Hopefully I can do a good job of answering them. Thank you all, by the way, for your attention and your the time you've been spending with me, it's, it's, it's good, it's good. Well, thank you, Ron, on behalf of all of us who, um, you know, that it's been a really, really interesting talk. And um, there are indeed are a lot of questions of which we're obviously not gonna be able to um, 
get to all of them, but we'll do the best we can. And okay. I just want, you know, you have painted a, you know, an amazingly vivid and painful and heartbreaking picture of erasure of, of, of you know, in, in so many dimensions of losing your culture, whether, you know, through actual sterilization or as your grandmother's, you know, said, talked about hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, and you spent a lot of time, your working life in integrating Native voices into curricula and developing the Native studies programs in the five colleges. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about that and about education and the role of education in, in trying to actually reveal the true history and, and helping people. Um, and, and, you know, you've talked about powwows as a way for people who are still, who are still feeling the anxiety about hiding. Just maybe talk a little bit more about your work, um, mm -hmm. you know, through the educational, through the institutions, as well as outside and where the challenges and the successes. Well, uh, golly. <laughs> that's a big question. I realize, I'm sorry, yeah, but. That's okay. Um, I see. Uh, all right, I don't know exactly. Okay. You're, in, in terms of the education bit, you know, one of the things that we tried to do is to get people to realize that Native history is American history and American history is Native history. Mm -hmm. There have to be ways, we have to start thinking sort of, for some, it would mean thinking outside the box to bring together all of these histories, these movements and so forth, these, uh, whether they're rebellions and so on. And I like to get people to think of, let's say, <clears throat> well, one of the things that I, I've, uh, in teaching literature, and I've attempted to do over the years, is have students engage with the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, this was an oral, this is an oral document. And uh, it is, uh, it is a democratic process. And its structure in many ways is similar to the uh, United States uh, government with the Senate and um, uh, the House of Representatives. You have the uh, Mohawks who are at the Eastern door, the Onondagas who are in the uh, Central Fire and the Senecas. And then you have the Younger Brothers who are the um, Cayugas on the West, uh, you know, over in the Cuba Lake area and then the Oneidas. The, from what I understand, the Tuscaroras who moved up in that area, they don't have any uh, real voting power in certain instances. But it was Ben Franklin who, even in, during the time of, let's say, after the Treaty of Easton, which took place, I think it was uh, 1850, 18, in the 18, early 1850s, he said, wouldn't it be remarkable if we were to learn something about how to govern ourselves from a bunch of savages? So I try to get uh, people, students to um, realize that, you know, let's think about, you know, if you don't want to believe it, then at least read it and think about it. Uh, Jake Swamp had put together a, a Tree of Peace Society, and he had aligned various principles in the United States Constitution, as they were almost replicated from the Iroquois Confederacy principles, the great law of being, the, the great uh, well-being, as uh, uh, John uh, Mohawk uh, uh, used to call it. So that's one of the ways that I would like to get people to start thinking about what else there is that they can do. Uh, let's say, um, and in looking at themselves and looking at their territories outside the box. Uh, another is, um, you know, even before uh, some of these books have been coming out, like um, you can't teach American history without teaching about Indians. Uh, well, you know, I, my first teaching assignment when I was at grad school down in Arizona, I said, look, if you're going to talk about American history, American literature, you have to start with the Native people, the indigenous people, okay? There's no other way to do it. Now, if this gets in the way of people making, um, saying, well, we can't fit all of this into one semester, 
we can't fit all of this into one year. All right, then make it two years or something. You know, you, you've got to, we have to, I'm being glib about that, I realize it. And, but uh, we have to find some kinds of ways to make these kinds of inclusions because they're important. You can't talk about, let's say, getting people out of the South, the native people out of the South because of the, uh, just because people wanted the land or because Andrew Jackson felt that, well, you'll be happier out in Indian territory. Indian territory, now the state of Oklahoma became a dumping ground for so many Indian tribes. Okay, I mean, I don't know how many there are out there besides the Creek, Seminole, uh, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Cherokees. There are Cayugas and there are Seneca communities out there. Uh, there's uh, uh, Apache community, uh, Kiowas. There's uh, Southern Cheyenne, uh, Oto and Missouri. Peoria and, and so forth, all of these people who are sort of dumped into that area. Now, why? You know, what, what's, what's going on here? And you have to make those kinds of connections with what had been going on with the uh, Dakota access and how the people are trying to protect that land and protect the water and so on. So these are among the ways that I think that uh, I, what I've tried to do in terms of uh, the teaching uh, where, you know, that's concerned. But also, I mean, I have other interests. Uh, I'm working, I'm trying to finish my Natives in Jazz uh, uh, project that's been going on much too long. I have, I'm, I'm wanting to do a, uh, a sort of a bibliographic essay on uh, the Native community that uh, is in Bermuda. And, um, and also uh, something on the, uh, the, uh, uh, that, that old tree uh, that was in the Hartford area, okay? Because it has a deep history uh, other than just being a, a charter oak, okay? So that's what we have here. Someone's trying to come in. Do they clean them? I'll come back later. Thank you. You know when you'll be uh, done for the night? Uh, by about 7.15ish. Yeah, no problem. I'll come back later. Okay. Surprise. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't hear you. I lost your audio. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, you're right. I was, I had muted myself. Sorry, I was laughing because I thought, you, um, we were not admitting people into the Zoom room, but in fact, it was um, the actual room. <laughs> <laughs> the actual room. Um, so I'm, we're trying to sift through some of these questions. You know, one that, um, well, there's been a question about if you could share more about your family history. I mean, you've certainly shared some, but that was a request. Um, also, um, maybe give you two at a time about what, whites, what white allies can do to help? I mean, you've talked now about sort of, the, you know, about the educational mm. aspects and you've talked about a lot of things actually in your last answer, but that was a specific question. I don't know what you might want to say to that. Well, I will take that last question first. Okay. Um, I would say, try to keep learning and also to try to be respectful. Mm -hmm. um, I think also one of the hardest things that a non-native person has to do in a particular person of European background is to tell their child and, and their grandchildren that the circumstances that we're living, you're living on land that belonged to someone else and uh, they were pushed out. You have to be honest about it. And you can't, I would say, there's no point in being uh, scared about it uh, in, in terms of being quaking and, 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 and so forth. It's just, that's how it is. We can't rewrite the past in terms of go back to the past, but we have to find a way to move forward and uh, respect one another, okay? That's a very mm -hmm. short and glib answer. As far as my own background is concerned, whoa. Um, I'll start with my mother. Mom was descended from at least three tribes, maybe four. Uh, the oldest, okay, all right, the, the one, the Jingiskin Reservation on the Eastern Shore of Virginia, 
you think of the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, and at the tip of that uh, peninsula, there's two counties. There's Accomack County and the southernmost is Northampton County. Okay. The Jenkinskin Reservation is uh, in Northampton County. The Jenkinskin Reservation was, has the dubious distinction of being the oldest or the first reservation in British North America it was established in 1640. Can you imagine that? It was supposed to have been up to about 1,500 acres. And then they said, oh, that's too much land. So they cut it down to about, I think, it was 792 acres. OK. So in 1667, uh, there is a record in the state of Virginia and the archives in Accomack County that a Captain John West took a um, a six-year-old boy into the courthouse and uh, gave him the name Ned West, and he was put into indenture until he was 24 years old when he was to be released, given a match coat, a pair of shoes, and a jacket, and so forth. And, and he was there for free, you might say. Uh, I've been able to follow, actually through, I have to give some courtesy uh, to, uh, uh, Helen Roundtree, but I was able to follow up on a lot of that uh, by backtracking on some of her work, which I found was inaccurate in some ways because um, this she had it that this boy was 16, and when I went to look at the records, he was actually six years old. Okay, now here where things get get pretty interesting. Um, when I was growing up, I used to hear that well. Uh, my, you know, mom would say, and her sister, her, my aunt Louise would say, "Well, our, my mother or our mother was Cherokee, and she was from Virginia." Now, I didn't understand much about, you know, modern movements around that particular time, but I figured that well, maybe they didn't move around. But here's what happened apparently: when I was in touch with um, the late Charlotte Collins. She was the clan mother for the Fox clan of the uh, Jenkinskin Reservation. And she was the one who told me that there was off the record, she said the historians didn't know anything about it, but there was a migration of several Cherokee families out of the mountain area of the Carolinas into the Eastern shore. So I also had a chance to talk with uh, a couple of people from the Akahonix uh, who are cousin tribes, uh, a cousin tribe to the Akamaks. The Akahonics were living, are, are living up in the, let's say that area of Southern Maryland in that Eastern shore area of that peninsula. So um, there, we are, let's say Powhatans, of the Powhatan, uh, we didn't join the Confederacy of the Powhatans. We're Eastern shore Powhatans. We're not Assateagues or Winkomikos or Chop Tanks. Those are different groups. And then when you get up into the uh, Nanako country, uh, you have, uh, those are known as a subtribe of the Lenapes. Okay. So, you know, you have, uh, this is why one of the reasons why it's so uh, difficult to try to explain all of this. And I'll just say, as far as that's concerned, mom's mother's, grandfather was born in 1830 or 1831 at that reservation. His name was Watt West. If you, the name Watt would be a Cherokee name, which would uh, signify that he was the first born or the oldest. Okay. Now, as an infant, he was, with his parents, forced to move out of the reservation in the wake of the Nat Turner Rebellion which took place in Southampton County on the tide water. Okay, now there is a document that says that the, they, the white people did not want any Indians or free Negroes on the Eastern shore. Why Indians? I could understand the idea of free Negroes, even if you call, consider free Negroes to be sometimes Indian, but why, why no Indians? I've been a little curious about that. 
I'll keep my, my, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say too much more about it, you know, in terms of that rebellion. But anyway, all of those allotted homesteads uh, were, you know, they were, uh, there was a massive sell off before the end of the year, according to both Charlotte and Francis Bibbins Latimer, who was the uh, uh, genealogist for Accomack County. And they didn't really get along to, with one another, even though uh, Francis also was a, was a reservation descendant. She identified as African American. So I lose track of my family uh, for about 50 years until 1880, and when I, they show up in Richmond. Okay, now it's very interesting. See, you asked me about my background. It's ain't nothing straightforward about it because um, something else you should probably know. We had, when you go to powwows and you see the guys who are known as the twins, some of you may know uh, Harry and Lee Edmonds, and uh, their cousin uh, who crossed over a couple of years back, Donna, um, Donna Mitchell. Uh, Donna and I had a conversation. I think it was at Skimitzen. It was about six or seven years ago. And I had always, Harry and Lee had always mentioned, and Donna had always mentioned that they had family who had come up from maybe the South who were Cherokees. So nevertheless, it was Donna who mentioned the word, the name Figaro. I said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? One of my great great grandfather's sisters married a man named Figaro or Figaro. Okay. And then they, uh, they moved up into New England. Okay. So, um, or at least one branch of them, uh, you know, the, the Edmonds. So that's where you have that. So you have a number of people. Charlotte had asked me to try to find, and I was able to find some of the people, uh, their, you know, uh, descendants of people who had moved up into the ge this general area. That's uh, mom's, now mom's um, father, his grandmother, okay, was, a, I believe that she was Assateague. The Assateagues are a small group who, uh, living in the area where, let's say, you know, if you can imagine the state of Delaware and that middle section of Delaware, I think that's Kent County, and the straddling over into uh, part of the Eastern Shore of Maryland, that's uh, Assateague country. And I remember when I was, oh, I guess, I don't know, it was early, maybe about 13 or so, I saw my grandfather came to visit. I was visiting. Uh, my cousins out in Berwyn, and uh, he he went out to came down the street, down the road rather. And I said, "Grandfather, was your wife, my grandmother, an Indian?" He said, "Yes, she was." And he said, as he was walking up the walkway to Uncle Harold's house, he said, "And so was my grandmother." And I said, "Was she from Delaware?" And he, I asked him, "Was she a Delaware Indian?" And he looked at me, and then he sort of, it was, you could see that there was this momentary stop a, a moment. And he said, yes, she was, but she was probably the Assateague, okay? Now, one of the things that I've been trying to do in my family, uh, well, my mother's side especially, is to try to get people to realize that, hey, look, this is the history. You can't erase it. Uh, there's no sense in trying to make it so that it's not, that these are African-Americans because they're not. Uh, because I've had too many um, people who would say, uh, in, even in the family, there was an elder who said uh, that uh, Joshua London Gray, who was my great-great-grandmother's, see, that great-great-grandmother's father, he was, she said, of one of the tribes uh, or clans in Delaware. Okay, so I mean, that's, you know, not trying to unravel and track a whole lot, you know, because Joshua Gray was, he must have been a bit of a trickster because he shows up in the two censuses, census for Maryland and a census for Delaware in the same year, <laughs> you know, the same person and so on. So 
where dad's, uh, so I was raised in my, my stepdad's uh, family. My, my biological family was also, his mother was, a, was native in South Carolina. Don't know what tribe it was, but um, in, uh, when I speak of Nana, when I spoke of Nana, she was the one who said, you know, she would go on a rampage and, 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 and so forth. Um, she never identified her mother's tribe, nor her father's. I think her father, who was a gover, by the way, uh, was a uh, uh, Nanakoke or member of the Nanakoke uh, Lenape tribe because the Govers, in 1820, the Govers were living in Harford County, Maryland, which is in the Northeast part of Maryland, okay? And then they moved up into the, uh, up, in, up to Brandywine, the Brandywine River and uh, settled in near Westchester, Pennsylvania, okay? Um, we used to go to, <laughs> Nana would badger dad to go to uh, South Jersey to see some of her relatives. Bridgeport, I mean, Bridgeton, New Jersey, Cumberland County, New Jersey, okay. Never said anything about that. We're going to see our Indian relatives. It was always, uh, you know, that's how it was. We're, these are our relatives and, you, and so on. You, this is how you relate to them. It's how you think about them. So that's, I guess you could say, and, and you know, there are people in the family who mixed, married, intermarried with uh, African-American. So, you know, that's, um, in fact, um, mom's mother, mom was four years old when she lost her mother to this influenza. This was 1924. And uh, my, her name was Viola. And uh, she, well, she had six children. Actually, she birthed seven, but one died and, uh, and so forth. So I don't know whether that's giving you too much more <laughs> than you want to have in terms of a kind of a genealogy. Uh, but um, growing up in Philadelphia was, um, was a very interesting time, you know, as far as being a person who wanted to assert one's native ancestry. I used to draw shields and designs on my loose leaf books, you know, when I was in junior high and high school, especially when I was in high school. And, um, you know, that's, and when I went back to one of my reunions, I think it was in 2012, my high school reunion, was my 50th, oh God, my 50th anniversary reunion, uh, Ken Strotman, remembered that I used to do that. He's a musician now, but he remembered that I, what I, I used to do in, in terms of those kinds of things. You try to keep those things close to your heart. I was six years old when my mother, I said something that I had seen on TV, as much as you could, you know, TV, there was in 50. And she slammed me against the wall and read me the riot act. Don't you dare say anything about Indians like that. And so uh, that's how it was. When you grow up, a lot of times as an urban Indian, you don't know much about. Uh, some people just never knew and they never found out. They never wanted to know. I was the person who, for whatever reason, I wanted to know. I wanted to know. So um, I guess uh, one of the things that if you can find a book that was edited by James Woods called um, uh, the confounding the color line, the Indian black experience or the uh, yeah, Indian black experience in North America. I have an essay in there. That's my essay called um, uh, A Most Secret Identity. And that's pretty autobiographical. If you can get a hold of that or find it and so forth. And it was written in almost 20 years ago now. So there's a whole lot more that I found out about the, the family and, and, and so on. But, uh, you know, I'm happy that I managed to be here. I, sp I speak with my relatives in Pennsylvania, my sister, and, uh, my other sisters, my two brothers and so forth. You know, they're, 
uh, they go to powwows. They they are trying to do some things there in Philadelphia, just honing you know in terms of what they want to do and can do. And uh, yeah, that's where we are. Thank you. I'm looking at the time, and I see you know there were a number of questions I was thinking of trying to ask, but I feel like we, you know, that's a, that's a really wonderful note to end on is your, is your, your story, personal story in history and all that you've been able to find out as challenging as some of it clearly was. Maybe I'll just ask if you have any last thoughts that you want to share. Uh, consider that when we say all our relations, that it's, that's a phrase that everyone can say because we are related to the bead of grass, the bugs, the insects, even the stones in the mountains, the hills, the trees. And these are parts of, these are parts of us that we need to take care of. And we should always think about that. Uh, it's not just us and uh, a, that tree over there, you know, uh, that tree, has a story to, to tell. And if we listen to it and we know how to listen, we can hear the story that it's telling. Uh, if we know something about birds and their actions, we can, we'll know something about how the, those birds are speaking to us. We are the younger brothers and sisters, okay? And we are our own worst enemies. So, we want to make sure that we try to live right, to walk in balance on our mother, who's the earth. And, uh, you know, the, the birds and the animals and the earth have spoken to us and, and has, you know, in our various traditions has given us ways that we can survive on her. And that's something that we should never forget. So I'll say, Pado which is thank you in the Cherokee language, Wanishi in the Lenape language, Tabatne in Nipmuc. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. That was a lovely, a lovely way to end. We can't, so on behalf of all of us, um, and I, I apologize for the questions that we couldn't get asked, but I think it was, it was a wonderful talk and deeply, deeply appreciated. Thank you. So, in conclusion, I would just say if any, for any of you who are interested in participating in a more in this series in a more hands-on way, we are beginning to form working groups that are addressing some of the issues that Ron has brought up about decolonizing curricula, land justice, opportunities for changing harmful imagery, et cetera. So um, just you'll, you can find where to go on the, on the Karuna website. And lastly, the next event in this series is called Memorials Against the National Grain with Dr. James Young of also of UMass Amherst, where we, we will explore when and how and whether memorialization makes sense. So again, there's more information on all of this on the Karuna website. And we also will have links um, to some of the things that people shared and certainly to all of Ron's, um, all of all the references that Ron made. So Thank you all for being here and uh, especially to Ron um, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Greatly appreciated. Thank you, Polly, and thank you, Christine. Thank you all. Thanks to, thanks to everyone who, who attended and participated and even those who have uh, moved along away from this. Uh, uh, you know, thanks again, it's really great. I thought I was gonna be a lot more nervous to deal with, but it, it's, it's worked out. You did great. And we survived the technology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you all. All righty. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.